Hi, my name is Isis Pinheiro, and I'm majoring in literature with a concentration in Africana studies. And my senior project is about uses of African American vernacular English, or AAVE, in poetry written by black women. So I chose to do my senior project on uses of AAVE in poetry written by black women because I really wanted to engage with AAVE in a way that best reflected my relationship to it and the relationships that I see like the people that I love have with it because for much of my education, uh, AVE was engaged with sort of a negative connotation, which was starkly different from how AVE shows up in my personal and regular outside of academia life. So I really wanted to engage with it in a more positive way. And so in my project, I add nuance to that by using black womanhood as a lens through which we can look at AVE as a um, expressive form, as an art form. And I add more layers to that by looking at the intersection of AVE, black womanhood, gender, and performance. And so it's, it was really fun to engage with because I got to look at hip hop, I got to look at spoken word, and I got to look at written poetry and see how these things are all different forms of art and really look at blackness and everyday movement as something that is really expressive and unique to us. And so ultimately, I'm really interested and curious about the ways in which we as people communicate with one, with one another and how we relate to one another and what makes blackness like have non-parameters and where the lines are between that. And as for highlights to my project, one thing that comes to mind is my third chapter, writing it was really fun because I look at a poem that has a lot of allusions to hip hop songs. So it was really fun to work with songs that I had grown up listening to and that I still listen to to this day. And something that was really funny for me was one of the allusions, uh, well, a couple of the songs that are alluded to are, are by LL Cool J. And so writing that was really fun because I just never imagined that I would spend so much, spend any time writing about LL Cool J, let alone like several paragraphs. So I just thought that was a funny moment. And then another moment that comes to mind is around finals time, final season last semester, I had a conversation with one of my really good friends about gender and the language around it because I had been really struggling with who I wanted to center my project and who I wanted my project to be about. I thought initially black women and then I wanted to be more inclusive and expansive and so I thought to maybe make it about black femmes but then that was difficult because not all women are femmes and the vice versa is also true. So that conversation with my friend was really transformative for me as a person and also for the project because I was able to get a sort of clearer gaze on gender and how best to approach it. And so ultimately I decided on keeping the project just to be about black women because I think that black women deserve that space to be heralded. Um, and not everything has to be super inclusive. It's fine to like focus on one particular group at a time. And so that was a really transformative conversation. Um, so Sahar, if you're watching this, I appreciate you so much. And then as for the final success of my project, I would have to give that to a couple days before the Spraj deadline. I'd printed it all out and made handwritten notes and reflections and edits. And as I was reading through it, I was looking, I was looking and I was like, okay, I, I was kind of, I was kind of doing some kind of spitting. And so that was a really great feeling to know that like taking a step back from it and looking at it as a whole, like it all made sense and it was all really coming together. And then of course, handing it in was a great feeling. Hi, my name is Liam Bach. This year I completed a biology senior project titled A Bird's Eye View of Perception versus Reality in Animal Conservation. I got the idea to conduct this study when I saw the World Wildlife Fund's symbolic species adoption page. This is a page of over 100 species of animals, all of which receive 100% of any donation that's given to them. And even though they all come from different biomes and do different things, the reason they're on this page is because they're charismatic. And I wanted to investigate how animals receive the conservation attention that they do. So I looked at the three main factors that lead to that, which is one, an animal is charismatic. 
two, it's ecologically important, or three, it is in dire need of conservation attention, like it's threatened or endangered or on the verge of extinction. So I used 16 species of birds, all of which reside in New York State, as examples of different levels of charisma. And birds can be considered charismatic for different reasons. For example, two of the species that were used in my study, the snowy owl and the ruby-throated hummingbird. The snowy owl is cool, while the ruby-throated hummingbird may be considered cute. However, they're both still birds, so they're comparable, and they're both still considered really charismatic. And I learned that by conducting a survey on 104 New Yorkers, um, and this gave me an idea of perceived charisma. Then I used the same species in a meta-analysis to find the importance of those same birds. And I operationalized importance as network centrality. Um, this is how interrelated any bird was. So a bird with high network centrality was really important to New York ecosystems because it had high interaction with plenty of other important animals and common animals and plants. And I compared charisma, importance, and vulnerability, and found that there was no correlation between how charismatic an animal was, how important it was, and its rated vulnerability of ecological status that I was talking about earlier. So this makes us probably want to reinvestigate the kinds of animals that wind up on the WWF's symbolic species adoption page. For example, animals that are charismatic are possibly receiving an undue amount of conservation attention. And that was my senior project, basically. Um, my experience with senior project, well, there was this slight thing going on called COVID-19, so that made it a little tumultuous. But in the end, I was able to create a final product that I was actually really proud of. And I supported my hypotheses, so I kind of did science even though I was disconnected from all the people who were helping me and at times it did feel like I was alone but with the help of all my friends and professors and advisors I think that I created something that truly was helpful and good which is really complicated word choice I know but yeah that's how I feel. My name is Scout Ederson I am a philosophy major and my senior project was titled Concrete Thinking and Images, Art and Image as a Site for Meaning in Hannah Arendt's Life of the Mind. So the project really had um, two origin points. My first question was, how does Hannah Arendt engage with other authors in quotation in her work? Um, she has a tendency to take quotations really out of context and really manipulate them and then ascribe the theories that she would create from that. And so I was just wondering, what is going on with that? What is the theory behind that? And the second major question came out of that. So if the appropriate way to read a text is to take these quotes out of context and, and really work our own thought into them, how do we go back and read Hannah Arendt? Particularly, I was interested in going back and reading The Life of the Mind. When I did that, I found this really interesting passage um, on visual thinking. It's only a few paragraphs long. But for the majority of the text, she talks about thinking as a silent dialogue I engage with, with myself. So it's auditory. But she says that in languages that have signs associated with the words, such as Chinese, that's her example, um, thinking might actually be more like a series of images. So a majority of the project was just an explication of this thought. Um, what does thinking in images rather than a dialogue actually look like? My interest in Hannah Arendt really started in the um, seminar I took on her my junior year with that was taught by Thomas Barcher, who then became my Sprog advisor. And that was really helpful because class, as well as my conversations with Thomas, ended up being a really strong foundation for the development of my thought later as I was writing. The hardest part 
was definitely that I had no idea what a project this long would even look like. I felt like I was really flying blind for a majority of it. I wouldn't say, I don't think I developed a thesis until probably a month before I turned it in and I probably wrote 100 pages of content that ended up being um, streamlined into about 50. And that was a really nice way to, it was a hard way to write, but it was a nice way to write because I really knew the ins and outs of my thought by the time the project was finished. Hi, my name is Chandler O'Reardon. I'm a psychology major, and the title of my senior project is A Bilingual Advantage for Children with Autism, Effect of a Bilingual Education on Set Shifting in Children with Autism Spectrum Disorders. So for my study, I've proposed a project that looks into how an early bilingual school environment affects the set shifting abilities of children with autism. And set shifting is just an executive function that people use to change their behaviors and their thoughts to adapt to new situations and environments. For my study, I will be following male children with autism for the span of two years who are either in a bilingual program or a monolingual education program and comparing them on their set shifting abilities. And I believe that after the span of two years, those in the bilingual program will improve in their set shifting abilities significantly more than those in the monolingual program. So I thought that this project was a really great experience for me. In September, I knew I wanted to do a project on bilingualism just because I've always been interested in language development and I just really wanted to explore more about that. But I wasn't really sure how to narrow down my topic, so I spent a few weeks talking with my advisor about that until I narrowed it down to focusing on kids with autism, mainly because there's actually a lot of research out there that shows that a bilingual environment can be really beneficial to the cognitive and language development of kids with autism. But there's still a lot of doubt that surrounds this, especially in terms of foreign language education and just bilingual education in general. So for instance, kids with autism are selectively excluded from typical bilingual education programs really, really often only because they don't have the facilities to accommodate children with developmental disabilities. And I thought it was really important to make a study that kind of addressed this and showed that it's possible for kids with autism to be included in these kinds of programs. So if a future study somehow is done and shows that my predicted results could be true, then that could really increase the amount of bilingual opportunities for kids with de developmental disabilities and could really just increase accessibility for them in this increasingly multilingual and global world. So yeah, I've really enjoyed the process of this senior project. I've learned a lot. Um, although it was stressful at times with me having to relearn all of statistics, I really enjoyed everything I've learned. I loved learning about more about language development and how it relates to cognition. And I think that this process has really helped me to gain more confidence in myself, both as a researcher and as a writer. So, thank you. My name is Walker White, and I did a joint project in film production and literature. I've just finished editing a cut of the film. It's entitled An Interior Dam. It's an adaptation of a novel, Oblomov, that really resonated with me during this time. It was a difficult process making the movie, especially during the pandemic, um, but I'm really grateful for the way that it brought a lot of different people together and I think that um, the effort was amply rewarded. It was very, very much worth it and it was very gratifying to see the project on a big screen. Then the roller coaster was steady at the peak for a second. And before I had time to look away, she turned around and looked right at me. E e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e
When are we going to show some compassion towards everybody? Towards everybody, man. It's just, and I'm just, I'm just one of thousands. I'm just one of thousands. Hi, my name is Duhita Das. I'm a current senior at Bard College. I'm majoring in economics and I'm from Brooklyn, New York. The name of my senior project is The Untouchability of Dalits, the Economic and Social Exclusion of Dalits in the Post-Independence Era. I have taken a really big interest in development economics after my sophomore year at Bard College. I was enrolled in Professor Sanjay Da Silva's Asian Economic History, and that was really one of the first times I had really ever learned about really Asia in general, and I realized that I was able to study my own identity through the lens of economics and economic history in this class, which is something I've never experienced before. And I remember when I was first sitting down, thinking about my senior project, um, I really had no idea what I wanted to do. I knew that I did want to, you know, think about economic development and economic history. So what I did was I went through my notes from this class and I was kind of reading my notes within the margins of my papers and I found the question, how come no one is talking about Dalits? How come they're excluded from economic development in India? And really Dalits are this marginalized group. It's a pretty massive group living in India and in the Indian diaspora who have been negatively impacted by social policy, economic policy over the course of many, many centuries. And in the year 1947, after India gained independence, there was a completely new constitution, new rulers, a new government, and Dalits, who are also known as ex-untouchables, which many are more familiar with that term, they were finally granted constitutional rights for more equality within society and economic policy. Unfortunately, that didn't mean that they were actually liberalized and um, discrimination towards them no longer existed. And so within my readings in the past few years, I've realized that for some reason, caste identity has never been a very large part of economic development. And I think that was one of 
the most jarring realizations I had come across because as an Indian American myself, I've, I've known caste identity and caste to subtly play itself into my own life. And so I thought it was pretty shocking that economists weren't talking about caste and how caste is a determinant of economic opportunity and social opportunity, yet it was so minimally spoken about, which, you know, come, gets me to my title, the untouchability of Dalits. It really means the untouchability of Dalits within economic development and rhetoric in general when talking about equality. So my senior project really was very interesting for me to learn more about because the topic isn't something that I myself had known much about, nor did many people around me know about. And so for myself, it was pretty difficult for me to just get my hands on um, data and extensive research, but I pulled what I could from various government resources and other economists and tried to piece together my story and really look at how Dalits have been excluded historically and what that might mean for the future. Um, it was very exciting for me to be able to look into my roots as an Indian American and really learn about caste and India from an academic lens and not a personal lens. Talking about caste identity has really given me a voice and helped me find my own voice and thoughts within my senior project. I'm just glad that senior project has given me the opportunity to learn about something that is so important to me. Hi, my name is Sakina Bennett. I am a Posse Scholar from Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm also a joint major in Dance and Historical Studies with a concentration in Africana Studies. My project is titled Blood vs. Water, and it is an excavation of the history my body holds and my journey within two spirits. So it touches on black dance um, in the church world, in black Baptist churches in the South, and it also touches on my story of meeting my father this past year. I originally chose this project in search of the answer for this big question that we all have, who am I? So I originally wanted to investigate authenticity and that led me to my history because I thought, you know, what makes me authentic is the all the different things that I carry with me. Um, so I really wanted to look at just my history and how that shows up um, in my work, in my dance, and me as a person. And then I also was very inspired by black dance companies such as Alvin Ailey and Ronald K. Brown and just what inspired them to choreograph, what inspired them to make um, very moving work. In January, when I met my father for the first time, this took a whole new line of inquiry. Um, and so now I really wanted to focus a lot on myself. I wanted to focus on the history that I held, um, not just the history from the different cultures that I had been a part of and involved in and inspired by. So I had a lot of talks with my mom. I had a lot of talks with my grandparents, um, even talks with my father about just, you know, where do I come from? Who are these people? You know, how far can we trace back? And so I was really interested in the history that I didn't know that my family cared and that I carried and that showed up in my work whether I knew it or not. This journey presented a couple of challenges. For one, I was touching on a very sensitive subject, um, which was my father. And so that was really emotional at times and I really wanted to be truthful and be um, authentic and sensitive with the story that I was trying to recreate um, in a stage space, which could be kind of vulnerable. I also was a little challenged by some of the collaborations that I did. So I worked with a professional musician, Munir Zaki, and he was amazing. But this semester, I had to learn, you know, how to communicate with a musician. I had to learn, you know, how dance and music can correlate with is the history that music holds even. I also was able to um, choreograph on a professional faculty member, a professional dancer, Solomon Bodolo, and it was just a whole new space for me to be the student, but now to be the choreographer and to put movements on my professors that I have been inspired by and in awe of since I've been here. So that was a very much a new space for me, but I'm very proud of the work that we were able to do together. I think the most rewarding part is just the how big of an accomplishment this is because as an undergrad, I got to really dive into some research that was really important to me and also produce a show that a lot of people don't get to do. And so I'm very, very grateful and that was so rewarding. I'm also very glad that I had the time to 
dive into who I am as a person, dive into my history, dive into my beliefs, and I got some grounding in those. And so I'm walking out feeling more confident in myself than I ever have before. My goal was to challenge academic text-based research and place more value on the research and the history that we embody and that we carry with us every day. Um, so that was rewarding to be able to, you know, have an idea and to really believe in it. Um, and to go forward with it. I'm also just very grateful that I was able to work through a very um, emotional and touchy subject in a beautiful and very supported way. Hi, my name is Will Santora, and I'm an environmental and urban studies and studio art major. And my studio art project uh, was an installation at UBS titled Threadlines. And the whole process uh, started actually last summer when I went down to the Hudson River in Tivoli and found about 50 buckets in a dumpster that Amtrak was using to rebuild part of the track sections. So I pulled those out of the dumpster and thought that they could be used for like a practical purpose or maybe they'd be fun to play with in my studio. So I took them with me and started the semester off with my advisor Ellen Driscoll uh, creating short, quick little verb structures where the buckets could act as little characters doing different actions. So I created little experiments with the buckets. Some were flying. Some were pulling, some were weighing things down, um, just to kind of get the ball rolling. Um, and at the same time, I was really interested in creating structures that could hold a large volume. Um, and so I went into the woods and started looking for saplings that I could bend and arch uh, to create a container or vessel-like structure. Um, and that whole process um, took a long time where I would actually bend the trees to arch them, let them sit for a month, weighed down, and then cut them and they'd, they'd have these uh, arch, the arch shape and I would connect them with straight branches. Um, so I tried that outside and then I brought them into my studio thinking that they would be, become vessels or containers. And so the whole first semester was really just a lot of experimenting with materials that I had. But once I was able to 
go outside of my studio into a larger space, um, everything sort of transformed. The, the wooden structures, I lifted them off the ground with string and pulleys, and so they started to fly, air started to move around through them. They became their own beings, really. And so I sort of reacted to that and started making more, and I eventually created three structures that were lifted off of the ground. And then I brought the buckets out, and after playing with them and realizing that they create amazing rust inside, I brought them out into my installation space and started playing around with them um, and the rust and spilling on the ground would salt in it and the salt would crystallize, the rusty water would dry and follow the cracks and topography in the cement on the ground floor, creating a, a huge mural that I added onto every single day by swirling the water around and pouring it and moving them around underneath the wooden structures. Some of the buckets were actually performing a task as a counterweight for the wood, and others were just drawing implements. But I really wanted the buckets to be alive, and they, they became characters for me. And there was also water movement in the entire space, because I, I didn't want the water to be stagnant. There, was, there needed to be activity for me in order to be happy with the piece. So water sounds filled the, the air, it was really very performative where the water actually got rustier over time inside the plastic tubes. Once the, everything started moving in the piece, it became its own creature and I just was sort of the maintainer of it. And I'm just really happy that I was able to have this large space where I could experiment and respond to what materials that I had so that if something didn't work out, I would have the time to allow them to be in conversation with each other, not fight each other. Like the wooden structures, I originally wanted to have inflatable structures inside. And so I tried that out and it just didn't work out together. And the wood needed to be on its own. Yeah, that's the, that's the result. It was just a chain reaction of um, response to what I was experimenting with and the things that I had. My name is Vivica Lari and I am a double degree student in the Conservatory in Trumpet Performance and in the College in French Studies with a concentration in Medieval Studies. My senior project is titled Wild Whales, How Cultural Discrimination Transformed Merlin from Britannic Legends to French Arthurian Romances. I chose this project because I was reading French legends about Tristan and Iseur, two Arthurian characters who people might know better as Tristan and Isolde, and I discovered that in the stories about them, although the, the, the stories are written in French, the places that are mentioned are, Cor are Cornwall, Wales, and Brittany, and some references to Ireland, but nothing about France. When I looked into this more, I discovered that most Arthurian legend originated in Britannic legend, so not actually French, and that it made, it, it was in Britannic legend before the year 1000, and it made a transition to French legend around uh, the 12th and 13th centuries, and it culminated in the first Arthurian cycle, which is the Lancelot Grail or the Vulgate cycle in the 13th century. And I was curious as to how that transition happened. And I couldn't study all of Arthurian legend, obviously, because it's a 100-page thesis. So I decided to focus on Merlin because he's such a specific character in the legends we know today. He's one of the very few good magical figures who also has an incredibly high standing at court. In fact, he's King Arthur's right-hand man. And when I was examining the origins of Merlin, I noticed that he made a transition from Britannic material to French material through Latin writing by Cambro Norman authors in the 12th century. Um, Cambro Norman authors named Geoffrey of Monmouth and Gerald of Wales, who were born in Wales, but educated in Norman society, probably in Paris, and as a result had the Norman cultural perspective, which when I looked into it further, was based on a very long history of vilification of the Britons and later the Welsh, their ancestors, starting with Roman invasions in the first century, continued with Britonic Latin figures from the sixth to 11th centuries and culminating in Anglo-Norman and Cambro-Norman vilification of Wales, calling it Hardos Cambriae or wild Wales in, after 1066 in the 12th century. 
I used this knowledge about the concept of wild whales to drive my research on Merlin, and I discovered that there are three major areas of transition that Merlin's character goes through that are very much affected by this mindset. The first is Merlin's Britonic origins as a prophet. Geoffrey of Monmouth wrote that Merlin gets his prophetic knowledge from a demon, which has a very negative connotation for 12th century Anglo-Norman Christian society. The second area was um, the origin of Merlin as a wild man, as tradition that's not very well known, and I didn't really, I was curious as to why it didn't seem to continue into stories that we know today, and I noticed that that is largely due to the wild man connection to Merlin. And the third area, which was the most intriguing for me, was the sudden development, started by the French author Robert de Baron in the 13th century, of a relationship between Merlin and Arthur out of basically non-existent interactions between them in Latin and Britonic material. So overall, I ended up with this three-part analysis, and there were two challenges, mainly. Um, one was the amount of translation I ended up doing, which was Old French, Latin, and a bit of Middle Welsh, which I don't know as well, but I started learning because of this project. And the second area was how to deal with this concept of wild whales and cultural appropriation, partly because Geoffrey of Monmouth and Gerald of Wales were both part Welsh themselves, and also because post-colonialism as a concept is, is not really medieval, so I couldn't exactly talk about it within a medieval context. I had to choose my wording carefully. And also I had to keep in mind that we have to be grateful to Geoffrey of Monmouth because without his writing, we wouldn't have Arthurian legends. So, as I said, I ended up with a three-part analysis of Merlin's transition from Britonic material to Latin material, and from Latin material to French material. And I noticed that in all of these parts, the Latin material creates a negative connotation over the Britonic, and the French material, whether intentionally or not, turns that negativity into positivity by, for example, Robert de Baron changes Geoffrey of Monmouth's demon origin of prophecy to a god origin of prophecy. And the wild man, instead of the concept of the wild man Merlin being about wildness and insanity, it becomes about righteous anger. And that sort of feeds into the characterization of Merlin that we know today as like a, a man. He's a, he's a wizard and sometimes he's off in the woods maybe, but he's always he's always superior to society when he goes into the woods. And then, for example, in the third part, I argued that Merlin and Arthur's relationship as intimacy and love is an opposition to Geoffrey's depiction of Merlin as subservient at court. And the final, the final point uh, that I would like to make is that I cannot exactly make any claims about cultural appropriation. I can only mention and comment on what I've discovered in my readings, but based on what I've discovered, I might argue that French Arthurian romance has the possibility to subvert the effect of Latin material on Britonic legends. My name is Stella, um, I use they them pronouns and I completed two senior projects this year for my double major in chemistry and written arts. My chemistry project is called Progress Toward the Biochemical Characterization of a Protein Involved in the Production of Microbial Plastics, 
with a subtitle of Asymmetric Synthesis of 3-Hydroxy Fatty Acids. Um, it's an organic synthesis project and I knew for a while that I wanted to do an organic synthesis project and I wanted it to have environmental applications and I've been working for my advisor Otto Pinto for a couple years now um, and his work with biodegradable plastics is really interesting and really important to me. So the research that I was doing over the past year was part of a larger project um, where the uh, small molecules that I was designing and making in the lab were going to be used to test the activity of an enzyme that's involved in the production of these um, microbial plastics. So it was definitely cool to know that the work that I was doing could have these beneficial impacts, um, but it was definitely a challenging year. I, I love to be in the lab, but it was definitely the most time that I've spent in the lab during the semesters. Um, and we also had sort of one specific challenge where a theoretically uncomplicated reaction was proving to be difficult in practice. So I spent a lot of time troubleshooting, but we ended up finding a workaround, but not until about March. Um, so that was challenging, but it was definitely exciting to find that workaround, and I do feel proud of what we did. And I think it was a great learning experience, especially as I prepared to go to a PhD program in the fall where I know I'll have a lot of unexpected obstacles in my research. And I get to keep working on this research this summer um, for Bard Summer Research Institute, which is a program I would definitely recommend. My poetry project um, was a more personal project. It's called Before You Grow Fruit, and it's about a um, family member who passed away a few years ago. I didn't actually expect to write my project about grief. Um, I kind of floated around a couple ideas in the fall. Um, I had actually had an idea for a few years where I thought I was going to interview like some exes and write poetry about stuff that came up in those interviews, even like rearranging words from the transcripts. But when it came time to start the project, that just didn't really seem like what was right for me. Um, and so I kind of struggled a bit in the fall, like getting my footing, even hit a point where I wasn't really writing poetry. I almost wrote a romance novel. I was writing a lot of songs, but the project did start to take shape. Um, I think that what was hard for me was just that the project felt like such a cumulative thing that had to be so representative of who I've been at Bard. But Ultimately, it's just a really long project that's a really cool experience to create, and it can be about whatever you want and representative of whatever you want, and a lot of what you've done at Bard will just sort of shine through anyway. Yeah, so I surprised myself, but I'm definitely proud of and happy with what I made. Hi, I'm Nico. I'm a senior in the philosophy department, um, and I turned in my senior thesis earlier this month to the social studies division of Bard College. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the project itself and then also just like the experience of doing the project and just give a more well-rounded sense of what Sprodge is like from someone who's lived it. Um, my project is a philosophical meditation on a lot of different things, intersubjectivity, eroticism, intimacy, love, um, and kind of using a philosophical approach to all of these different, though related, I would say, like, yeah, different topics, um, to think through the problem of liberal consent, which I define in my project as a um, linguistic or juridical model of thinking through sexual violence. And I argue that that doesn't encompass the entirety of the realities that we should be thinking seriously about. Um, in terms of my experience doing the project, um, I definitely started out not knowing what to do. I developed my thesis at the beginning of the semester with my advisor. Um, and as time went on, I think, especially in the first semester, I got farther away from what knowing what I actually wanted to write about. Um, and moving into the second semester after my midway, everything kind of like clarified itself and like synthesized itself, but it did require a good bit of patience and like ingenuity and stress management to do so. Um, but I will say it's very rewarding to, first of all, feel like I've completed something that is important and has stakes in the world. And also it feels good to 
know how to do a bibliography and citations <laughs> um, and to just like be able to like learn how to use the library learn how to use a bunch of different sources um, and just have like really good conversations with people and I think that's the bulk of like what made my project so great is just talking to my friends and my peers and kind of through conversation honing more and more what the project was going to be um, and seeing it kind of like carve itself out rather than me sort of trying to impress the project into existence. So yeah, that is what I have to say about my senior project. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dimitri Addis Laurent. I use they, them pronouns and I'm a theater and performance major. My senior project was directing a new play called Whitewashed. In the theater and performance department, you have the option for your senior project to collaborate with somebody else. So I partnered up with my fellow theater maker, Morgan Barnes Whitehead, and she wrote the script and then I directed it in the Loomis stage at the Fisher Center. She and I have worked a lot together over the years and while studying theater together at Bard, we realized that both of our theatrical inclinations usually tie into themes of family, identity, race, and queerness. So it made sense to collaborate on this project. We both really loved the casting and rehearsal process since theater is so inherently collaborative and relies on working with other people. Uh, and to cast the piece, we approached several students who we've worked with and seen in performance throughout the years at Bard and who we really admired. And they gave us so much to work with. Each one of them worked so well with everyone else and really brought their own sense of self to the piece. We also got to work with a dramaturg for the first time, which was really exciting as we've never been able to incorporate that as an element of our theater before. Our creative team was really the driving force that made the senior project possible. Our biggest obstacle was definitely COVID restrictions as theater was hit especially hard by the pandemic since it relies on being close to other people and expression and seeing each other face to face. And so we sort of had to work around that in a really new way which allowed for us to be really creative in terms of coming up with solutions. But since we were also working in the Fisher Center, which is such a high traffic you know, space, it meant that they also had their own set of restrictions and safety protocols that we had to adapt to and learn how to work around. In order to supplement the safety protocols of both COVID and the Fisher Center, uh, we ended up supplementing our piece with other elements of art. We used visual media and film and drawings and music and in the end we came up with something that I think was really creative given the circumstances we had to work under. Since theater is so collaborative the most important thing was finding a team of people who were really conscientious and flexible of everyone's time and safety and since we had already had to sacrifice some of our artistic vision to make sure that we were all safe and healthy. This was a really important part of the process and I'm really grateful to the team that we came up with because everyone always came ready to work and with their own ideas about how to move the process forward. Um, and I think that this was definitely the most rewarding aspect of the entire project. I think the most successful part of the project was definitely the world building that we all did together. Theater is about working together and using your own real life experiences to inform a character or a situation or an entire play and the work that we all did in the first few weeks of rehearsal to really fill the world of the play out helped our actors so much in terms of developing their characters and the final piece is something that I'm really proud of and I'm really happy with. Hi sweetheart, how was the mall? Truly an experience. You can come and sit. Oh, I don't want to intrude. Not an intrusion. <laughs> I'm just suffering through this book club romance. You don't like romance novels? I love them. There's something about this one, though. I can't quite place it. <laughs> so the mall. It was like another world. You didn't have a mall nearby growing up? We did. I just never went. Oh. <laughs> I couldn't get my kids to come home from the mall. Back in the day, that's where Brad used to take me out too. <laughs> you know, Colin had his first job there at a pretzel stand. Oh, he was so cute in his little hat, little working man. <laughs> um, well, what did you do instead growing up? Instead of the mall? Mm-hmm. 
I spent time with my mom. How sweet. It was. Sweet, I mean. I'm sorry. No need to be sorry, sweetheart. Your mother sounds amazing. You know, Hannah loves romance novels. If you're looking for recommendations. I didn't know she'd gotten back into reading. That's lovely. I never really knew her when she didn't read. I felt like I didn't either. All kids go through phases. I just got worried that one wasn't going to end. Was it a goth phase? Quite the opposite, actually. Uh, hold on. Would you mind if I recorded this? Um, no. No, of course not. But ask Hannah before you use any of it in your project. Of course. Day 26 with the Michaels. This is Kate um, on one of her daughter's childhood phases. Go ahead. <clears throat> well, um... I think it started in eighth grade. Puberty is especially rough on girls. I know it's a difficult time for me as well. She's always been such an individual growing up. Very unique and of course loved how different she was. But when she hit those teenage years, she really wanted to fit in. She started dressing differently. She swapped out a friend group for a new set of girls. You know, growing up, she'd always been friends with my friend's daughters, but all of a sudden she wanted nothing to do with Becca or Anale anymore. It was concerning. I started getting calls home from the school because she was breaking the dress code, picking fights with other girls. You're going to ask her about this yourself, right? Before you use it in your project? I would never use anything without her permission. All your names will be changed at the final product, so if there's anything you'd like me to leave out, I'll absolutely... Oh! I have nothing to hide. <laughs> Hannah's just so private. Right. I'm going to make some tea. Would you like some? Hello everyone, my name is Song Hong and I'm from China. I studied in the Bard Conservatory of Music, the WV program. I played the violin and my second major is psychology. Today I'm so happy to share my senior project in psychology with you. My senior project is the, t the effect of TDCS on motor skills. So what is TDCS? TDCS is transcranial direct current stimulation which is a non-invasive brain stimulation technique that we used a lot nowadays. Uh, the reason why I want to focus on the motor skills is that as a violinist, I played a lot and I spent a lot of time to practice when I was in China, sometimes six to eight hours a day. Um, later, I just started to think, is it possible we shorten the practice time, but at the same time, we keep the same level of the playing, which at the end, it's possible. So that's why I did this research. Um, how we do that? So to make it easier to understand, here is the, mo here, uh, here is the head model. And we use this device, TDCS device, to give, humans uh, to give the brain stimulation. As you can see, it's connected to the battery and there are two electrodes, one in red and one in black. The red one, we call it anode stimulation, which will transfer the positive uh, current stim stimulation to the brain, and the red black one will receive it at somewhere over the brain, and it will transfer back. So this will cause, uh, uh, make a current stimulation flow over the brain area. And we just need to put over the motor cortex to improve, uh, to improve the 
uh, excitability of the br this brain area, then it will transfer more neurons to the human's muscles, and uh, then then the muscle will transfer the neurons back. So after a five minutes of stimulation, it will build a really strong uh, connection between your brain and the hand. So in that case, your practice efficiency improved. Um, I remember when I tested this by myself, um, I learned a piece just like uh, for three or four days, but I used this technique. Um, I didn't practice too much. I only practiced like one hour or two hours a day, but after four days, I can memorize it so well, like it's more become naturally in my hands. So this is really um, uh, amazing that I did this study. And for more things that I want to know is that since I only got the physical results, but I want to know more about the neuron uh, factor behind this. So yeah, thanks for watching. Hi, my name is Natalie Jones and I'm from Honolulu, Hawaii. I study physics, but during my time at Bard, I've also been involved in the music program and I work backstage at the Fisher Center. My senior project is an X-ray astronomy research project entitled Brightening of the Bridge, Reflections of a Past Sagittarius Star Outburst in Galactic Center Molecular Clouds. This project began last July during virtual BSRI, which is the Bard Summer Research Institute. I had done other kinds of research before, but this was my first time working with my advisor, Shuo. During the summer, my advisor, Shuo, taught my research group uh, the basics of X-ray astronomy, and we also started working on a new observation from the New Star Space Telescope. This observation took place in February of 2020 and is of the galactic center of the Milky Way. This observation captured something really exciting happening in this molecular cloud nicknamed the bridge. And so I just basically kept working on this data into the school year because Shuo thought there was definitely something like new and exciting happening. And that's how my senior project became studying new star observations of the bridge molecular cloud. And what I discovered through my research is that between 2012 and 2020, this molecular cloud doubled in flux. And the most likely cause for this increase in luminosity is that the cloud is reflecting a past X-ray outburst of the black hole Sagittarius star. Senior project has definitely been challenging. X-ray astronomy is really hard. Like I had to learn how to code, I had to learn how to use the analysis programs, and I had to keep track of all the models I was using. But when I step back and think about the fact that I got to basically play around with space data, um, for an entire year, it's, it was just really, really cool. I had this opportunity to do real scientific research that I'm gonna present at a conference this summer and hopefully we're gonna publish our results as well. Another rewarding part of Senior Project was actually writing about the physics. Um, my professors often say that the true test of your understanding of a subject is if you can teach it to someone. And I really feel like the writing process was the process of figuring out how to teach the subject to the reader. And I really hope that my younger physics classmates can read my project and be ready to continue with my, my senior project or start a new one. Hi, my name is Arlo Tomicek. My pronouns are they, them, and I studied music and dance. My senior project in music was entitled Anticipated Futures. It's a podcast where I cultivated 125 hours of interviews and it is available on all streaming services now. You can find it on Spotify, SoundCloud, Bandcamp, or wherever you listen at Anticipated Futures. And in the podcast, you will find that Bard students discover and explore their hardships throughout the pandemic as they find certainty in the uncertain, control in the uncontrollable. This theme continued throughout my senior project in dance, which was a three-part work which contained two uh, projects of performance, two dance concerts, and one written thesis of 40 pages. You can see the full works on Bard's Vimeo at Bard College Fisher Center um, or on my website arlotomichek.com. And in these works I discuss uh, our converging crises and how we reckon with it, as well as reckoning with grief and ancestral healing. And I'll leave you here with a clip of the senior projects. But before I leave you, I wanted to thank the many hands that helped facilitate these projects and make them possible, as well as my advisors, Matt Sargent and Jean Churchill for encephalating curiosity into my work and feeding my hunger for life.
Hello, my name is Liam Mayo. I'm a 2021 graduate and I'm a written arts and literature double major. For my literature senior project, I focused on the epic poem by Geoffrey Chaucer, Troilus and Crusade. It was written in England in the late 1300s and it's set during the Trojan War in ancient Greco-Roman times. The poem follows two lovers, Troilus and Crusade, as they meet during the Trojan War, as they fall in love and begin to conduct an illicit affair, and as the conflict eventually tears them apart so that they end up on opposite sides of the war. My interest in this poem and the guiding force of this project was the character of Crusade. I was really interested in her as a character because there were a lot of debates about how much agency she had within the text. Whether she was a character in her own right, with the agency to carry out her own plans and with her own motivations, or whether she was just a secondary character, blown about by the whims of the more narrative characters in the text. I was interested in seeing where I stood on it, and as I dug into it, I became very interested in seeing where the narrator stood on it. The narrator is a character in their own right in Troilus and Crusade, and the more I read the text, the more it became clear that they had their own opinion on Crusade, and they had their own view of who she is and what they wanted the reader to view her as. The claim I ended up making for the project was that Crusade is a character with agency, that she's given a very bad hand of cards by her social constraints and by the expectations various characters within the text have for her, but that she plays that hand of cards well and ends up with about as good a result as she can be expected to have, given her starting position. I also tried to make the case that the narrator tries to help her out in giving her a sense of agency within the text. The narrator has a lot of descriptors of Crusade that try and temper the audience's expectations of her, and a lot of the narrator's work within the text is to address their reader and to say, hey, I know you have this certain view of Crusade based on the way she's viewed in popular culture, but you need to put that aside, you need to focus on who she is, and you need to take her for her place in this text. Hi, my name is Thea McRae. I'm a senior studio arts and anthropology major. And today I'm gonna talk about one of my projects, which is my anthropology project. I started my research a little earlier than normal because I did it for a class, an ethnography practicum, where we practice our research in the field by doing a mini project. A friend of mine in the fall of 2019 took me to a development in Red Hook that he thought I was interest, would be interested in, um, and he was totally right. It was completely fascinating. I used this um, experience as um, a jumping off point for my research in this class, which got cut off due to the pandemic. So I picked it up back up again for my um, anthropology sprodge. Um, which I did on this development called Tradition at Red Hook, which is a new development in Red Hook. It's a traditional neighborhood development, which um, is a type of new urbanist practice that uses different architectural elements to encourage a neighborly community. So they make porches that are lower to the ground. They widen sidewalks and make the streets narrower so that cars have to slow down and pedestrians are prioritized. There are a lot of public spaces, so there's um, like a community green, there's um, walking trails, and there's a mail house, so everyone has to go to the mail house to um, get their mail and talk to each other. And they believe that this emulates a way that we used to live, um, which I challenged in my paper, because I wanna know if um, you can really influence social interaction through design elements. I think anthropology is really interesting because it you know, reanalyzes things that we normally take for granted. And so even though you might not think that a development in Red Hook is worthwhile, I learned a lot about change politics um, in a local town here in New York.